powerful one. Welcome to this edition of Inner Growth with Uselswa Elimike. I hope you're doing well this season. Let's talk about wholeness. What does it mean to be whole? I am Uselswa Anthony Elimike. You know me, I am in the game of helping you grow from inside out. That is the drill. <music> to be free from ailments. Now, it doesn't mean that your body will not experience some wear and tear as a result of existence. You will have the normal aches and pains, which are evidence of existence, evidence of life. But there is a power within you that heals that wear and tear. When you have a life where your body no longer is able to heal of its own accord, then wholeness is greatly compromised. Wholeness simply means the capacity to bounce back from wear and tear and become completely whole again. That's one part of it. Now, but why is it that people are not able to heal completely? In the last video, I talked about the concept of forgiveness and forgetting. People think that the ability to forgive and forget is not within their reach and therefore they have constricted themselves into that corner, into that place where they live on the false assumption that forgiveness is not a human virtue. But the truth is that it is a human power, it is a human responsibility because the power of wholeness which is resilience in itself is what makes all things possible in that area. If you commit to forgetting and forgiving, you will attain it. At the initial stage, there will be some resistance in your system from your system, but when you keep at it and keep focusing on that thing, you will find out that you will bloom one day. You will just find that the roof is off and you see the beautiful sky above you floating lovingly because you have made a decision. Mind can never be railroaded. You cannot command mind to start doing things it is not used to overnight and it will do it. It will not work. Mind must be seduced, must be gradually led down the path of acceptance of whatever new path you want it to do. We human beings have been grilled into the understanding that we are powerless, we are weak, hence that expression, I am only human, which simply means that humanity is powerless, is sinful, is evil. That is the old concept of psychology, the Freudian school of psychology, where they believe that our inherent nature, which is the id, is negative, it is self-destruct, therefore you need the ego and the super ego to supervene and control the id. But the truth is this, it is false. Human beings are inherently good. L. Ron Hubbard, years back, through his book, Dianetics, Modern Science of Mental Health, explained clearly with full evidence that the human being is basically pure, basically good, basically very powerful. It is when what he called engrams, which is negative interpretations, of experiences which is a traumatic intervention of data in the human system comes into the play that that human capacity for wholeness for power for purity for strength is eroded over time he calls it the downward spiraling process because at the time you keep picking up all of this negativity you find out that your capacity begins to dwindle the capacity for normal joy, for example, for just being happy for nothing that babies have, we lose them. Because we have allowed another level of thinking to come in, which is focusing on the effects of life. We live out the life, we focus on the effect. I was chatting with a friend of mine this morning on WhatsApp. We're talking about how life has become. And I told him something. That the reason we are not happy the reason we cannot afford to grow at the pace we want to grow is because we have left out the main cause, the main purpose, which is life itself. And we have gone to run after the effect of living. If I were to ask you right now, what is the basis of life for you? 
what do you think is that thing that once you achieve it, your life will be great? Are you likely to tell me, oh, money, marriage, relationship, childbirth, career, I want to have one particular job, I want to be promoted to a certain position, and when I have all of these things, life will be great for me. If that is what you are thinking, zero. These are the consequences of living. But, you know, it's not anybody's fault. It will not be your fault if you are thinking that way because we have been trained, we have been raised into that understanding that the basis of life is material acquisition, is externalization of our being. So when we were children, we were raised to think that way because from education, from everything, we were being pushed outside, not ever inside. Okay? When a child is sad, for example, you buy them gifts, you buy them toys because you have come to understand that the only way you can make your child happy is to give them external things. You were conditioning that child to become externally orientated. And there's no way you can train that child in an adult level like you and I are right now to say that life is not based on material things. But if you have given that child time, sat with the child, played with the child in the dirt or whatever it is on the carpet, and you explain life to the child, you make the child see that life is much more than money, it's much more than work, okay, much more than career, then things begin to open up little by little. The child will begin to realize that there is a connection between its childhood ideals and life indeed. But from the age of five, six, seven, eight, a child begins to be rudely yanked off its ideas, which is the ideal of humanity, which is the ideal human mentality. They begin to tell them that life is not the way they see it. It starts with the screaming at them when they are playing. When they are happy, you say they are too happy. Okay? And when they cry because you have not given them attention, you scream more at them. So they come to realize that life is about the adult world. It's not about them. That they are just playing at the peripheries. They are not really the main cause of life. If you cannot make a child feel very important as the center of existence, as in real sense of the world, let them know that you live for them. Not by giving them money, not by buying food. Like some parents will say, is it not because of them I'm, I'm suffering? Now, the idea of suffering for a child is a program that we are giving to us by our parents. We are also passing it across to our children. We are not to suffer for anybody. We are to live for one another. Suffering is a program, it's a negative program which states that life brings pain and we must suffer as a result of our pain. But you see, there is a thriving mentality which states that life may bring pain, but pain is not the definer of my life. Pain is the basis of me asking for more, is the basis of me expanding, is the basis of me breaking new ground. Pain tells me I am too slow. Pain tells me that I am too lax, that I need to move. That's what pains represent in our lives. It is not a thing that should make us suffer. It's not a thing that we should be regretting, we should be afraid of. Fear of pain is what leads to stress. Stress will lead to the erosion of our vital force. And when our vital force is eroded, we become weak before forces of life, be it physical diseases or mental diseases or environmental diseases, we fall prey to them and then the downward spiral begins. But the truth is, we can stop it by reorientating ourselves into the real core purpose of being, which is growth. It is the growth, not of the physical height, it's not of the very vertical or of the horizontal, it is the growth that is inside, getting to know more, getting to know who we are. Why we are. What is our purpose on this earth? What are we doing here? It's like somebody wants to become a footballer. He says, the reason I want to be a footballer is because of the noises of the stadium. All those screams, the voices of the spectators, the commentaries, all the gamut of it all. I love football. I want to be a footballer because of that. I want to be a footballer because of the awards that they give people. I want to be a footballer because of the money it brings. I want to be a footballer because of the star nature of the game. You see, all of these things we all know are the side effect. What are the core things that make one a great footballer? First of all, there has to be love for the game for the sake of the game, first of all. So, the first thing about life is that you have to fall in love with life for the sake of life. 
not because of what you are getting from life, just because of life. And that can only come when you connect with your inner being. When you connect with your inner person, you will be happy for the sake of life without any cause. Even in the midst of abject lack, when you have no money in your bank account, money in your wallet, you will find a reason to be happy. And that reason cannot be explained. You are happy because you are. That's the first thing. The second thing about being a great footballer is that you have to have skills. You have to develop skills and you will have to have stamina. So you have to build it up. We are all born with stamina, but we build our stamina. We build it by exercising, by placing strains upon ourselves, by pushing the limits. There is a limit for everybody's action, but that limit is not the definition of our capacity. We are far more than our limits. But the only way the limits can expand is for us to expand and to grow and to expand and grow there must be pressure placed on our present comfort zones so pains bring that pressure and when we respond negatively to pain by retracting then suffering comes and then we are not able to grow but when we welcome pain and say bring it on what is the next level what is the purpose of this pain what should i do I need to move because I'm not going to stay here. I have to keep pressing. Then you are placing a demand upon life.